The Liberating Arts seeks to articulate the enduring relevance of a liberal arts education during a time of pandemic and protest. Through our online platform, we will host a series of conversations with writers, academics, institutional leaders, and public intellectuals about the nature of the liberal arts, their formational purpose, and their moral significance in a time of great cultural disruption. We hope to inspire viewers and listeners to learn more about the liberating effects of these arts on their own lives. To find out more, please visit www.theliberatingarts.org or find us on Twitter, Facebook, Spotify, or YouTube. Welcome to another episode of the Liberating Arts Podcast. Uh, I'm very excited to have a special summer uh, conversation with Leah Bayens, who is the Dean of the Wendellberry Farming Program, which she will talk more about because uh, it's kind of unique, or it is unique, I think. Uh, and it's a collaboration between both Sterling College and the Wendellberry Center. So I'm sure both of those institutions will come up in our conversation. Uh, her PhD is in English, but she also has wide ranging interests in, uh, the, in sustainable agriculture as her work uh, draws from. And I hope that we'll talk today both about the program she directs and its particular aims and goals, but also about how that might uh, inform those of us who are concerned with the liberal arts and maybe particularly uh, the importance of uh, either how the liberal arts might form students to address our ecological crises, and, and more particularly, um, how we might educate students to uh, participate in sustainable agriculture in some, some fashion. But Leah, I wondered if you could start off by giving us a brief introduction to the Wendellberry Farm Program, which uh, some of our listeners might not be familiar with. So if you could just talk about how it came to be, what it tries to do, and you know, both about what's unique about it, uh, your location and many other things, but also how at least aspects of it might be replicable at other institutions. Sure, thanks so much. Uh, thanks for having me and asking me to be a part of this really important conversation. And uh, I welcome the opportunity always to talk about uh, the work that we're doing here. And I agree, I think that it's quite unique. And so, um, I thought it might be useful to just give folks a kind of a broad sketch of uh, what we're about. Um, as you mentioned, uh, the Wendellberry Farming Program of Sterling College um, is the result of a collaboration between the Berry Center and Sterling College. So Sterling College is up in Craftsbury Common, Vermont, and the Berry Center is here in Henry County, Kentucky, which is the uh, generational home of the Berry family. And all of our coursework is offered here in Henry County. Um, we offer a tuition-free junior and senior year farming curriculum that is focused on the ecological management of livestock, pasture, and forest using draft animals and other forms of appropriately scaled mixed power system. So it's a combination of draft power and combustion power, but we're always thinking about scale. Um, <clears throat> and this work is inspired by uh, the life work of farmer and writer Wendell Berry, and really, uh, as we mentioned, designed through that partnership between the Berry Center and um, and in Sterling College, and we're serving undergraduate students from Kentucky and from elsewhere who intend to farm. Um, I will say that we have had in our first cohort of students, which just graduated May fifteenth, which we were particularly proud and delighted about, uh, that we have also had students who have enrolled in our program for whom this is a second bachelor's degree. So we combine previously earned credits with, uh, with our curriculum in order for the students to earn a Bachelor of Arts degree in excuse me, sustainable agriculture and food systems from the college. And um, this is a, Sterling College is a federally recognized work college. So we also integrate 
uh, work program into, into that curriculum as well. Um, we have cohorts of 12 students because that's how many people we can uh, afford to uh, provide the tuition free grant um, for and then also we're really very, very conscientious about scale and capacity and just really making sure that we develop this in a way that's manageable and which has, um, it, which is mindful of the community here, you know, to, to uh, immediately, I just can only imagine what it would be like to um, immediately uh, plop down 50 students into Port Royal, <laughs> Kentucky, what that might be like. So this is a nice way to ease in. Um, you know, actually, just, just by way of, of uh, adding in a bit of a plug, we are currently recruiting for our second cohort and we do have a few spots still left available for starting in towards the end of August. So if there is anyone who's listening to this podcast who is interested in applying or knows someone who is interested in applying, then they should just contact us immediately. We'd love to have a conversation uh, with, with folks. And even if it's not for this co cohort, when we start recruiting for the next cohort, it's a great idea to just touch base with us. So um, we are uh, really just in, you know, immeasurably, <laughs> immeasurably pleased with the first cohort of students who came through and most of whom are still living here in our area. So we didn't have to say goodbye. Um, we are forming a net, they are forming a network of which we are a part, and that is a good ongoing community work. Um, in addition to providing that, uh, well, the way that I introduced this is rather in some kind of typical technical terms associated with agriculture programs, uh, even if draft power isn't typically a part of those, uh, still kind of focused that production system. But really what we're doing is a farmer education that links the liberal arts to farming, forestry, draft power, and good land stewardship. So our goal is really unique in agricultural education and also in, I would say, generally is quite unique in education, which is to interweave a hands-on liberal arts farming curriculum with a diversified mid-scale livestock farm uh, using appropriately scaled power and marketing systems. So I think quite often about a, an early conversation that I had with Wendell Berry, and it was probably in 2011 when we first really started developing the curriculum. And he said that truly, um, excuse me, that disciplinary boundaries begin to lose their efficacy in truly interdisciplinary education. Um, and that has been a real touchstone for us as we developed, uh, as we have developed and refined uh, the different iterations of our program over the last uh, number of years. And with that in mind, really melding together subjects like, I'll, I'll just, I'll kind of list out a, lit, uh, a, a litany <laughs> of what we cover. So agrarian literature and arts, agrarian and natural history, uh, draft and combustion power, as I mentioned, uh, rural leadership, small, uh, small business and farm business management, uh, livestock production that's really suited for good land use and for viable and ethical markets, um, tool and equipment use and maintenance and repair, uh, restorative forestry, as well as agricultural policy and farmer advocacy. So really trying to take in the swath of the, um, I'll say subjects that ought, to be, that ought to be taken into consideration. And to do all of this, the farms and the forest and the waterways and the community itself, I mean, all of these constitute our classroom. So, the Berry Center provides for the Window Berry Farming Program a 200 acre farm right outside of Port Royal, Kentucky here. Um, and that serves as our primary experiential classroom. Um, and we have a small herd of cattle, we have a flock of Katahdin sheep, we have a team of mules and two teams of oxen, <laughs> but it, as, this is our starter kit. <laughs> We've just gotten onto the farm uh, last summer was when we, we got onto that land. But, 
we really um, depend on the local community for so much of, of what, we, uh, what we learn. And, you know, we're really carefully studying the history as well as the present of this particular place, um, recognizing that, uh, for instance, that indigenous people have always lived on the land that we now call Kentucky, um, continue to live here today, descendants of Shawnee and Cherokee, Chickasaw and Osage people. And, um, you know, we've, we're, we're putting all of that into the big picture of current habitation um, and thinking about, you know, honestly, I mean, we've hardly scratched the surface of knowing this particular scrap of land in this particular community in many ways. Um, but we really aim to understand it as well as we can to determine our roles in that lineage, the lineage of this place. So um, this is, uh, yeah, this is a, it's a job of work and it's invigorating and exciting and challenging. Um, but we have, as I mentioned, you know, the uh, really um, uh, enthusiastic help of the people who've been farming here and living here uh, for, you know, some, some of them for generations and some of them more recent um, uh, residents. Um, but the most, I'd say the, the kind of the, the key influence for us or the key help for us has been integrating our work and learning with the Berry Centers initiatives. So we have the Our Home Place Meat program, which is a burgeoning farmers cooperative. We have the Agrarian Culture Center. Uh, we have the Agrarian Library and Archive, which is documenting the Berry family's legacy and rural advocacy. And in fact, we use our farm as a research and, and it, will, it will develop into a community demonstration farm for the Berry Center's Our Home Place Meat program. Um, so, you know, that, that is a, a, a component that really brings the stakes of our work into um, distinctive relief, uh, makes, makes them very real. So the, you know, the idea um, here kind of taken together is to develop and, and, and practice a curriculum that combines the arts and sciences with community-based cooperative economics and training so that our students work with local farmers and economists and rural advocacy groups, as well as with the Berry Center staff. Um, so, you know, we're really contributing to uh, a, a piece of the Berry Center's work, which is to really focus on the survival of small and mid-scale farms. Um, and uh, as we, one of my colleagues, Dr. Ed Fredrickson uh, said, one day, you know, we're studying how to be profitable within ecological bounds. <laughs> that just resonated for me. That was it. That's it. You've got to be able to afford to farm well. And that is, that's a piece of, of what, what we're about. And it's certainly a piece of the Berry Center's work, you know, supporting farming that is inclusive and equitable and parity based and resilient. Um, so, you know, that's the, the kind of the, the big picture of what we're, what we're doing. And in, to your question about um, how, how this could be useful to other places, um, you know, our, the point for us is to serve and learn from our place and in the process to create a model, uh, excuse me, a model that is place transferable. So, the way we think about it is that if nature is the standard for our vision, as we think it should be, then it follows that the means for that standard will be determined by the particular particularities of the places in which, you know, that in which this work. Is. So a, you know, it, it, what that, what the, um, what the, how do I say this, the, the kind of this, the substance of what a program in another place would look like will be different, but some of the kind of foundational ethos and some of the foundational outcomes we think could be transferred 
as opposed to replicable, transferred to other places. Um, I do think that for, for folks who are interested in creating a program like this, that having a community anchor like the Barry Center is, is pretty essential for bringing the work out of the academy and into the community and bringing levity to that curriculum by making it more than just an exercise. Um, and I think too, that it helps to reinforce the kind of humility to understand that we have lots of things to learn from local cultures, that it's, it's, uh, it's more, it's certainly not a one-way street or a top-down model. It's a mutual production of knowledge between the community and the educational institution. Um, so that's, that's certainly something that we're, we're testing out. How does it look here? How could it look in other places? Is something that, um, yeah, that, that we're very interested in. Yeah, and I think to your point about, at the end about um, finding good institutional partners, I mean, uh, it, the Barry Center is certainly a unique institution, but, but I'm sure there are other, other communities have variants, you know, that their own institutions that, that uh, educational institutions can partner with. And, and, and I would encourage listeners, if they're interested, to, to look out for the um, video of the recent commencement. Uh, that was, I think, a heartening peek uh, that those of us at a distance could get at the, at the celebration of your first class. And uh, Wendell Berry spoke there, as did many others, and uh, students spoke, which was a, a great speech. So. Um, yeah, I, I am excited to see how those students will continue to, to serve their place. Um, also, I, I wanted to kind of follow up on this institutional question, uh, because this past year, so many of us, several people on this liberal arts project and thousands around the country have lost their jobs in higher ed, and those who remain often face tightened budgets. So it can be difficult to uh, think creatively about launching new prop programs or um, you know, adapting existing ones and improving them when you're just trying to survive. Yeah. But I thought you have faced your fair share of institutional disruption. When I first uh, encountered the, the Berry Farm program, oh man, I can't remember what year it was, but it was, it, it was the conference that was in Louisville and then we went out to-, to Oh, okay, mm -hmm. 2012. Well, somewhere in there, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or 2013, actually. I think it was 2013. Okay. Yeah, spring. Um, so that was a, a great encouragement. And then uh, only a few years later, St. Catherine College shut down and you kind of went on hiatus, I think, for a year or two and found a new institutional partner. So if you could just right. talk through that transition and what you've learned from, um, I guess, the, 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 the perception of scarcity and how you do mm -hmm. good work, even when there's not always uh, abundant resources. Yeah. Whew. Yes. Um, first, you know, I just uh, want to say that the St. Catherine College's closure was devastating. Um, and so for those folks whose institutions are closing uh, and for those folks who have lost jobs, lost communities, um, I feel that, I feel that viscerally and, and deep in the bone. Um, the Dominican sisters had been teaching and farming in Washington County, Kentucky for over 200 years. Um, they still farm, but their legacy of teaching here ended and there was a palpable vacuum in the community. Um, I have many dear friends in Washington County and the students who attended the program there, they keep up with one another. We were fortunate we had a, a, a first uh, class of students who graduated. Uh, other students, we helped to resettle them into other colleges, primarily here in the state. Um, but we, you know, we worked closely with them to make sure that they were, that they were settled. And they keep up with one another. They support one another. And that is what we wanted. Like we, that's a positive outcome. The positive outcome of all of this is that there was, that community was real and that those connections have remained intact in different ways, um, but, they, but they are there. And just to kind of give a bit of a background, I was reviewing some 
details because some of this I kind of, you know, <laughs> supp suppress a bit. <laughs> uh, but it, it was useful for me to go back and review, you know, the school was really embroiled in a legal battle with the United States Department of Education over financial aid funds that the DOE wrongfully withheld from the school. Um, and in spite of admitting that mistake, the department's withholding financially crippled that institution, as did economic sanctions and just a litany of just arbitrarily shifting rules and regulations. And so there's that, that big piece um, from a federal regulatory agency perspective that was um, for, 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 for me, someone who had been, you know, I'd had a window into different components of higher education administration throughout my time in grad school and then as a faculty member, but this was just in your face, <laughs> um, it, um, as they say, uh, in, into the, into the, out of the frying pan, into the fire, real um, education in the, how those systems work. And also, you know, St. Catherine was not different from many schools that in that in an attempt to really increase enrollment and overall revenues, they offered really deep tuition discounts and in the process exacerbated those fiscal shortfalls by spending more money per student than it actually brought in. And so uh, as I was researching some of this aftermath, I encountered what was called the Sweetbriar effect. Um, and like Sweetbriar College, St. Catherine experienced a shuttering that was born of declining enrollments and financial exigency, but also it, it occurred in this kind of this, what I would say is a gaffe by the Department of Education. But it was still, it was very indicative of the place that many colleges were in, which is that they had very tenuous financial uh, grounding. Um, you know, I think in the broader higher education landscape, we see public and private colleges and universities alike sinking like millions of dollars into facilities that provide amenities based uh, college experiences, for instance. <laughs> um, and rather than doubling down on frugality and economics, they invest in things like luxurious housing and climbing walls. And there's a lazy river at LSU. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this to me just sends a particular kind of message about the role of education. And um, of course, you know, while the Berry Center uh, certainly appreciates a good dip in a watering hole, a lazy river <laughs> was not on the docket. So when the Berry Center set out to find a new institutional partner for the program, we understood that organizational mission alignment was really paramount and that frugality was kind of primary among those values. And at the top of the list also for us was an institutionalization of ecology-based agrarian thought as we had experienced with the Dominican sisters. So, so frugality and agrarian institutionalization, like that narrows the pool pretty significantly in the higher education landscape of the United States. But uh, I um, was, you know, I was so heartened when our friend Fred Kirschenmann recommended to us, we were out at the Land Institute for the Prairie Festival and Fred pulled us aside, pulled me and Mary Berry aside and said, look, we, you know, I know that you're looking for a new institution with which to partner. Um, you should really look at Sterling College. And I knew about Sterling because when I was doing curriculum development at the beginning of the program at St. Catherine, I had done all sorts of benchmarking, looking at different sustainable ag curricula, looking at different environmental studies, um, the whole kind of scope of things. And I love Sterling's curriculum, it's hands-on, liberal arts, education and sustainable agriculture. And I thought, well, gee, it's just too bad they're in Vermont because we're certainly a Kentucky-based program. And so what came of that is that uh, Matthew Durr, the president of Sterling College, contacted Mary and asked to have a conversation. And to meet with us and Mary and I both were of the thinking that, well, that's, that's all well and good, but we're not moving to Vermont. And when Matthew came down to talk with us about the prospects for any kind of a partnership, he said, well, no, of course you wouldn't move to Vermont. This is a Kentucky-based program. You should have it here in Henry County. 
and this is how we can make that happen even at a distance. Um, we did a really, really long discern, it was a long discernment process between both organizations. Um, we thoroughly, we thoroughly reviewed their finances. We found that they are frugal. <laughs> um, I mean, my, Sterling College is just so, so small. Um, I thought St. Catherine with, you know, enrollment between 500 and 700 was small after being at University of Kentucky. Um, we have an enrollment of a, a you know, a, let's just call it an a, a, like 115 to 120 students at St. Catherine College, including the 12 students here in Kentucky. And so, you know, we, we really looked carefully at each other, you know, does this help Sterling College fulfill its mission? Does it help the Berry Center to fulfill its mission? And what we found is that um, at the Berry Center, we use this, we use this kind of phrase that we're, we're, we're thinking about a kind of agriculture that scales out instead of scaling up. So you're scaling it out across the landscape, you're involving more people, you're um, settling the landscape and communities with people who know how to tend it well, as opposed to just concentrating land and power and money and access and influence into the hands of the few. So one of the ways that Sterling College conceptualizes its mission is that they too are scaling out. So if they, with such a small college and such a small community, if they started scaling up their student enrollment numbers and their kind of concentration there in that place, it would be a particular, there's a holding capacity there, um, a carrying capacity that would be breached. And so for the, for the college, this is a way of scaling out that really solid curricular vision and um, you know, decades of practice in experience-based, ecology-based liberal arts education. So that was really the shared, you know, that, that shared aim for students to develop an understanding that a sound, just, and mindful local economy um, that is based on nature's standard as the production for, excuse me, as the standard for work and production. I mean, that's that was um, that was central for us, and also it took lots of philanthropic support. Um, the Novo Foundation of New York. Uh, the Nova Foundation provided our grant funding because they understood the importance of this work and it would not be possible in this way, shape and form without that. Um, so it's still tenuous. I mean, it still depends on philanthropic support to make this happen. Um, but so far, so far, so good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a really remarkable program in that it's tuition free for the, for the students, um, which I think is so crucial because, you know, one of the, the, the topics that always comes up is affordability. And it's yeah. part of why so many students feel the pressure to major in disciplines that have clear career opportunities at the end, right? So I got to get a degree in, you know, obviously the big ones like nursing or engineering, but even, even other professional programs. And, and a lot of times I think students would want to study something else, but they feel like they can't justify going into debt X number of tens of thousands of dollars right. to then, uh, you know, have uh, a low paying career or, or even, you know, mm -hmm. so I think the fact that you can do tuition free, um, offer this tuition for your students is crucial. Um, and I wonder if you, if you have anything you might say uh, about land affordability too, because um, that's the other challenge I think with farming these days, there are a lot of young people who want to farm. Uh, I'm from the Seattle area and out there, you know, it's, it's crazy because land is so expensive, but mm -hmm. it's really a problem everywhere. Um, so if, I guess if there's anything you've learned from your work uh, uh, at this farming program, mm -hmm. uh, are there ways that we can um, help young people who have the proper education and that their genuine desire and commitment to doing agriculture well, 
uh, get them connected to land so that they have the opportunity to to increase the eyes to acre ratio as, as Wes Jackson. Says. <laughs> as Wes says, right. Yeah. Oh yeah, this is, yeah, it's part of the conundrum. Um, first to say that um, I think it really behooves students to think very carefully about the amount of debt they will accrue. And at the same time, um, I hope that they will pursue their educations in ways that provide them the most ability to be good thinkers and to be good members of communities. <laughs> and that doesn't necessarily track along with um, clear vocational education. Um, you know, so chalking, I mean, we, we have, we have come to a point even in liberal arts education where, um, higher education is being equated with job training. And I absolutely understand that pressure. At the same time, I see that people who have become so specialized for one particular field, I mean, there's no way that you can act, that we can predict what fields will remain in changing economic and cultural landscapes. And so it's just, it's quite a double-edged sword in many ways. Um, that's not very useful, I don't guess, but it's, it's I, I think that it, it behooves people to think very carefully about what, why they're entering into higher education, especially when it involves a big price tag. <laughs> Um, particular to agricultural education, uh, I could, you know, one of the ways I'm able to sleep at night, still fitfully, <laughs> but is to know that we're minimizing as much as possible the debt load that people who intend to be farmers will be carrying. I mean, this isn't an entirely free educational experience. Um, there will still be their cost of living. There will still be, we, I, I will say it's a minimal, we, we choose whatever the free source, cheapest <laughs> forms of materials are that we can possibly muster. So books and materials are pretty scant uh, in terms of fees, but, you know, minimizing that debt load as much as possible while still recognizing that the students will, even over the two years, they will accrue some either debt or they will make some sort of financial sacrifices in order to participate. Um, but they, you know, and, and being as, I think it's really important for us to be as clear as possible with the students about what the economic landscape is in agriculture and for them to be very, very practical and pragmatic in their thinking about what this is gonna look like for them and for their, families, whatever, whether those are biological families or a, a cooperative, you know, whatever that kind of configuration turns out to be for them. Um, so neither entrepreneurial farming nor large scale farming is set up for people to be able to make a living wage at this point, just by and large, just in general. So you know, we try to equip students with enough of a kind of a tool toolbox that they can figure out how to make, we, we call it make a living, not a killing. <laughs> um, and also recognize that they will in all likelihood probably have to have some other form of farm, off farm income. Um, this is not terribly uh, unique. I mean, uh, uh, farms have, have farmers have typically had some other kind of side gigs, but what we see in the landscape now is that people have full-time jobs off the farm and then they have full-time jobs on the farm. <laughs> so um, we're trying to mitigate that. <laughs> and that's where the Barry Center's work is really important to us because it's trying to put something in the middle there. Um, so this is a rather 
apologies, this is a rather meandering way to, to work to this issue of land access, uh, which is to say that it's a, it's a piece, it's a big piece of the challenge for new and beginning farmers. Um, we really try to work with generation, uh, folks who hail from generational farm families um, because of their perspective, perspective land access. Not all of them do, but many of them will have access to land. Um, that is also a way of, of, you know, cultural influence and cultural change. Um, but certainly uh, recognizing that we need to call on connections that we have that put landowners and farmers together outside of a tenancy system. I mean, that, you know, leasing and tenancy is, yeah. I mean, it's got, it's got such a fraught history of inequitable conditions, both in the, I'd say a history of the past and a present that, that has lended itself to being quite inequitable. But um, that's, one of the, that's one of the outlets that's available to students now. If you find someone who really has a, um, you know, you have landowners who have a commitment to the vision of farming that the students, or the, in this case, the graduates of our program bring to, um, you know, bring with them there is that possibility. That's definitely one of the, um, I can think of one of our graduates right now who just through our, through mutual connections within the program, there is a farm down the road that was available that the family wasn't farming. They wanted it to be farmed. They met with our student uh, over months and that's, it's gonna happen. They're gonna be leasing that farm um, and starting, she'll be starting her farm operation. So, I mean, it, it happens and it can happen in a way that is fair, but it's still without any kind of guarantee for long-term long -term occupancy in that leasing arrangement. Um, you know, I don't know, there's, we've seen uh, different organizations that are working on successional planning with seasoned farm farmer mentorship of a newer beginning or you know mediumly <laughs> medium experience uh, a person who you know could work alongside that farmer it, you know with the possibility of successional planning um, and I you know I think that one of the the biggest challenges that we face, Two is thinking about minority farmland access. And, you know, that's one of the, the focal points for our development as we forge and strengthen relationships, uh, certainly throughout Kentucky, but also with organizations that represent minority farmers is figuring out how, how to, you know, what role we might be able to play in, in facilitating um, land access for uh, far, you know, for, for young um, farmers of color, particularly um, women of, you know, women who farm, that sort of thing. So you can tell by the fact that I don't have a succinct bulleted list for exactly how to do this, that it is a proper challenge and it's one that we're thinking about and at this point, what our approach has been is to try our darndest to work the relationships, work within the relationships that we have, seek and continue to seek and build relationships beyond that, to try to connect students with the people who will be most like, likely to, you know, to facilitate that access. Um, yeah, I, mean, it's, I wish it, I had a better answer. <laughs> it's a big problem, and I think uh, yeah. the, the approaches you're taking are uh, all sound good, but it's not something that you know one one institution, uh, one educational institution can right. hope to address. So, yeah, yeah, and that's the other piece is, you know, we we have some. I mean, we do have 
yes, the other piece is, you know, we're an educational institution and then like how, how far, how far can our reach be? We, we do have, I should say, um, we, we have been working on some plans that if we, for an endowment, for fundraising for an endowment that would provide um, the backing for loans for graduates who apply so that, you know, that would be a, a piece that we could play in helping to provide land access. Um, it, but, you know, again, that's, that's our kind of our long-term philanthropic fundraising goal would be to establish something along those lines because we recognize the need. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, I guess the, the good news is that there are, it seems like more and more students who, uh, want to do good work uh, on the land and in local rural communities. Um, so hopefully that demand will help uh, other state creative in, in addressing the kind of structural challenges that you're talking about. Right. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you about uh, Wes Jackson's phrase that students need to major in homecoming uh, as a kind of counter cultural uh, major given the, the education for upward and lateral mobility that's uh, I think he says all of the majors offer. Mm -hmm. um, and it, you know, my experience has been that, that more and more students are receptive to this and open to it. Uh, obviously, the ones who find their way to Sterling College at the Berry Center are self-selecting minority, perhaps. <laughs> um, but what's your take on the appetite that among students for uh, an education to serve their communities? Uh, for an education that trains them in ways that are counter to the dominant cultural narrative that equates mobility and uh, a high paying career with you know, having made it. Right. Um, yeah, I, I think with the students, as you say, they are to some, you know, they're, they're self selecting. I mean, this is a very particular program in so many ways. Um, it, it, but you know, they're very receptive to this. And also it's a learning process for each of us. Um, you know, they pretty readily accept the reality that nature has its own standards of quality and systems of judgment and that local places and cultures and people matter. And so we try to use this as our starting point for figuring out satisfaction from and with a place. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 as I was thinking about this question, I went back to, um, actually, this is one of the questions that we use in our application, uh, actually for the first cohort. I can't remember if we used it this time. We, we just kind of switched it up a bit. But in the documentary film, Look and See, Wendell Berry says, and here's the quote, um, you can see all the way to the stars from almost any, any place you are. To live in a place and have your vision confined by it would be a mistake, but to live in a place and try to understand it as a standpoint from which to see and to see from there as far as you can is a proper challenge, I think. Um, so, you know, we, we're, we're, we, uh, you know, this is kind of this place based education and the idea of homecoming of making a home someplace or uh, going back to one's, you know, home community in which they were raised, or uh, if they can't do that, then being able to, to really make roots in a place wherever it is that they end up, um, you know, that, that's a, uh, we, we try to make sure that we're humble enough to recognize the privilege in all of those scenarios. <laughs> um, but focus on how being rooted in a place, particularly in an agricultural community, can be a source of contentment and continuous interest. And so, <clears throat> you know, we, as I say, you know, we recognize that home and rootedness are quite complicated terms. Um, you know, you think about what about traditionally nomadic cultures, you know, herders and the like. Um, what about forced migrations born of climate catastrophe and war and industrial capitalism and racism and sexism and xenophobia and job loss? Um, you know, how, how can we live out the idea of home place in this kind of ecological agrarian sense when so many people find it increasingly difficult or 
impossible or unsafe to settle in one place. Um, you know, we think too about why, excuse me, um, how those who are settled in places can help the displaced make it home, make that, those new places into home. Um, it, you know, in the face of disintegrating cultural and ecological cohesions, we look for examples that help us to figure out how to deal with the social and environmental factors that challenge homecoming or which make it altogether impossible. And, you know, we wrangle with these kinds of questions. It's really kind of acutely important to us. Um, and, you know, we, uh, as you might imagine, we also often use Wendell, <laughs> uh, his work and the, and in fact, <laughs> the person is a kind of go-to in trying to work through these things. You know, Wendell doesn't rule out migration as a possible piece of homecoming. Uh, he recognizes, for instance, domains of traditionally nomadic cultures um, as those that are and uh, have been predicated on the study of land and air and water as the keys to making life possible. Um, and at the same time, it's so important as, as Barry does in the unsettling of America to really delineate those like power over dynamics that have forced so many of these displacements. And uh, his, I have pulled out a quote here from the unsettling of America in which he says, generation after generation, those who intended to remain and prosper where they were have been dispossessed and driven out or subverted and exploited where they were by those who were carrying out some version of the search for El Dorado or in other words, upward mobility. And so I think that what we do is we recognize that placidness, inhabitation is, uh, is not always contingent on being static. It, and in some ways it, uh, at this, by the same token, generational habitation in a place does make a difference in, know, in knowing how it works um, culturally and ecologically. Um, but by recognizing that this kind of search for El Dorado is of a piece with this pursuit of upward mobility that has destabilized and it creates this kind of negative feedback loop in destabilizing so many communities. Um, that's the kind of thing that we like to, to say, all right, let's, let's check ourselves. Um, this is not about severe austerity. This is about being able to make a good and whole life with and from a place. And what does that look like? Um, doesn't mean you don't want to want to visit other places to see what they are like and how things work and, and to learn from them. It means that that's not conducted as a kind of uh, like a, just a, an accumulation, a kind of a capital accumulation of that culture that you're like, oh, I've done that and I've done this and now look at me and I'm a cultured person. <laughs> you know? um, so contextualizing all of that and, and, and checking ourselves to say, well, why, what is it that I really value and, and how, how is it that I, I might call on interdependence with others as, a, as an expression of freedom, as opposed to some sort of like subservience to market forces or subservience to like an ideology of accumulation, um, that kind of thing. You know, yeah, and, and your, resonates. <laughs> your notion of freedom there, I think, is, is um, germane to the whole project of the liberal arts, right? That we're, the, the right. idea is that we're forming students to be free persons, but th this doesn't mean that they're going to be free from all obligations or free from interdependency, but rather that they are free to um, to be generous, to, to, to be right. liberal with um, their neighbors, to, to love well. And I think, uh, as you know, you know, Wendell has written so eloquently about um, those that the 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 nuances of freedom that our culture is losing, and and again, there's no uh, silver bullet that an institution can do to remedy all this. And you know, it, in a place uh, in an age of divorce, I think he also has that line in Let mm, um, Him You can't fix everything, but you can begin to put the things together that belong together. 
our, our um, project obviously is about the liberal arts and it's a kind of notoriously difficult phrase that people define in different ways. And I wonder if, if you could define it in terms of your program. And I wanted to give you this quote from Two Economies mm. um, because it's one that I've returned to too often talking mm. with my students where Barry writes that good work moves virtue toward virtuosity that is towards skill or technical competence. But I like this link, the etymological link between virtue and virtuosity or between um, you know, kind of moral character formation, you know, a, a, a kind of person, but also people who can do stuff, you know, you, you know how to, uh, in your case, I suppose, work with draft animals or, uh, you know, the, mm. the ways to actually help the soil improve. So it's, you, you need professional skills, uh, but those are not sufficient on their own. So uh, I guess if you could just talk about the liberal arts and how at the Berry Center or the Berry Farm Program, you try to accomplish kind of these two, these two ends. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yes, it is very, very hard to define the liberal arts beyond a simple, uh, well, it's the arts and it's the sciences. <laughs> but I think that, <clears throat> I think that um, it is the arts and the sciences within the context of uh, practice and in the context of a place that is a neighborhood or a, a place that is a community. Um, the, um, uh, one of, one of, the, one of the, um, the writer philosopher practitioners that um, Wendell and Mary Berry um, kind of it enriched my life with was um, Simone Weil. And she talks about justice as being an embodiment of reciprocity and responsibility and obligation. And that, um, it, you know, it moves us, moves us beyond uh, a, 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 you know, distributive idea of justice. And I think that it also for, because I associate education in you know, this is the activist orientation of my pedagogy. I associate education with justice, and that definition of justice for me is based on obligation and responsibility. In that, like obligation and responsibility, often have, I think, have developed quite negative connotations in some way. But there's a a pleasure. There's a pleasure in those in those in, in being responsible for what happens to the people in your family, or the people in your neighborhood, or the people with whom you've become acquainted, or the people you don't know, or the the land, the land and the air and the water. Um, those kinds of um, responsibilities are a joy, um, and also they're hard, and that's part of joy too. Um, so. <laughs> one of the one of the things that um, that we talked about in some of our early conversations with Wendell about this kind of a program is that um, the idea that education should return to the concept of love, and he didn't mean that in kind of a sweet sugary way, but in um, in a in a very fully rounded form, and that love is certainly a concept, an idea, at the same time that it is also a practice that is shown in practice. And so I think that probably part of what it, that folds into, at least to some extent, this selection that, that you made that, um, that we're moving toward virtue, toward virtuosity, um, towards skill or competence. It takes practice to know how to be um, patient, how to be humble, how to look at the, look at the, uh, the person across from you with whom you know you utterly disagree and to be able to recognize the humanity in them and to say, you know, this person has something that I can learn from them and I don't know what that is yet, <laughs> but I'm going to sit, I'm going to sit and be um, and be able to try to figure out what that, that is <laughs> and to disagree with people and also to love them is, is a hard, hard thing. And so I think that what 
what we are doing is taking the um, the long view, uh, and the long view is of a consilience of knowledge, the consilience of the disciplines and the consilience of, of practice and thought. Um, you know, Wendell defines agrarianism as a way of thought based on land. That for me is just the perfect encapsulation of what the liberal arts can be. Um, and, uh, you know, I, <laughs> I would, you know, I, I, I've, I proudly come from a long line of people who do all manner of things with their hands and their brains. <laughs> Um, so, uh, you know, they possess skills and knowledge gleaned in and out of schools and, um, you know, because of what they've taught me and what they have done, I would be hard pressed ever to learn those things in, in the kind of academic settings that, that I have been raised up in. Um, so, you know, I, I, I am kind of doubly defensive when, uh, education is chalked up to job training and like ceaselessly and uncritically separating the practical and the liberal arts like that that I just don't have a lot of patience for it, even though it's definitely, there are pieces of that I was kind of brought up with. Um, but you know, that, that creates a kind of false cultural hierarchy that is socially destructive. And in the end is really an aired version of how authentic education works, that merging the arts and sciences and merging the liberal and the practical arts is getting closer to what, like when that happens within a, structured academic context, it's getting closer to what can and should happen in whole cultures. Well, that's, that's very helpful, I think. And, you know, so many of the people that we're talking to in this project are uh, doing important work, um, but, and oftentimes actually in community, you know, different community development um, opportunities, but nobody else really, it, there's not a lot of people, I think, doing it really so grounded in in the land so i love your definition of uh, our various definition of agrarianism mm -hmm. and, and you know thinking about uh i think he talks to too and settling that, that one of the marks of a healthy culture and i would say too one of the marks of a healthy education is the health of the topsoil um and, and if our topsoil is not doing very well maybe that is in some ways an indictment of mm. dominant modes of education that that are uh at, to blame so that's kind of a, a kind of a bleak conversation in some ways. Yeah. I'm actually reminded of Barry's commencement address at, at the farm program where he, he started off with this kind of doom and gloom, you know, as he's been saying, for <laughs> he years, sure did. not getting better. Come on, middle, bring it up. But then, then he ends with this advice about how to be uh, happy. And I thought that was so delightful mm -hmm. uh, and so typically, uh, mm -hmm. so typically Wendell Barry. But uh, what gives you hope and your when you're uh, fitfully sleeping or worried about some of these challenges? Who are the people or the ideas or the ventures that uh, are your guiding lights and that give you hope for uh, for the work that you're doing? <laughs> oh, well, I love to talk about hope. Um, not necessarily optimism, right? Right, right. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, if we said about this work uh, with the expectation that there was going to be some sort of victory, um, uh, you know, that would, boy, would you be disappointed. Um, what, Mary constantly reminds me what her father has said to her over and again, over and again, which is, um, you, you don't always win, but you don't lose either. <laughs> so you can see there's a real stream of, uh, of, of sunshine here. Um, but, you know, look, we're, we're doing what we think is the right thing that's in front of us to do. And that's, that's all we can do. Uh, and, and that is life-giving and um, fruitful and also frustrating. And, you know, just, right, this is the work. We're doing it. And we're going to do, do it the best that we can. And we'll probably do it the, you know, sometimes we won't have the energy to do it the best that we can. We'll do it how we can right then with what we got. And, you know, um, that is living in, in that realm is, uh, that's okay. That's okay for me because I, I can imagine the ways that I might become uh, just overwhelmed by 
the immensity of, of the forces that have created um, so much of, of what we deal with on a daily basis. And, um, you know, taking heart in the good examples of people in my own life, you know, my, my father-in-law and mother-in-law who were excellent um, and are uh, excellent gardeners and land caretakers. Um, thinking about my friends, Arthur and Martha Young who farm over in Washington County. Uh, Arthur is uh, 83 years old and just um, has just been carefully stewarding his land since he was a young person. Um, just looking at the good examples and of course reading lots of good examples you know um, just thinking thinking about how people have have been creative and have have not given into the crisis of imagination uh, that leads to desperation and instead have said let's make something if that's like pumping your fist in the air when it needs to be done then that's what it is and then also it's an undercurrent it's a working through you know the the kind of the whole suite of what it takes to embark on cultural change um, so i'm grateful for the many good examples well thank you very much uh and i, and I hope this conversation will encourage and hearten those who are doing good work where they are, even uh, mm -hmm. when the prospects are not conducive to optimism. But uh, <laughs> nonetheless, there is always opportunity for hope and for good work. So yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. I really appreciate it. And I hope you have a great rest of the day and uh, rest of the uh, in, in embarking into your new territory. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, um, hope to be in touch soon and uh, otherwise uh, take good care.